It was one of those crisp, beautiful fall mornings. The, you, you know the kind where, where, where it just seems like everything is in its place. Everything is as it sh- should be. The sun is still in the sky. Uh, the clouds haven't covered it up yet. Uh, the leaves are changing colors and, and it's just warm enough. It's, it's crisp where you need a, maybe a light jacket or a sweatshirt on, but it's not, not so cold where you just hate everything. And it was in this moment, in this, this time frame where he, he was walking along in an orchard, walking along a path, and he reaches up and he just plucks an apple up off the tree. And, and he's going to bite into it, but you know, you got to clean it first. And he's just, he's thinking about stuff and he's just throwing this apple up into the sky and, and, and catching it as it falls back down. Walking along, probably whistling as he's going, throwing the apple up, catching it, throwing the apple up, and he catches it. And this is a smart dude. And one time he throws the apple up and he catches it and he's like, man, I, I wonder, I, I wonder what's making the apple come back down. He's walking along and he's throwing the apple up and he's catching it. It's like, there's, there's a reason behind this. And maybe it's bigger than just the apple. Maybe it, maybe it explains a whole lot more than just, just this one apple. But what goes up? Seems like it's got to come back down. And in that moment, birthed the idea of discovering gravity for Sir Isaac Newton. You know Isaac Newton, right? He is the, not the inventor of gravity. That was God. He discovered it. Uh, and, and he had this quote that said, what comes up must come down. The, 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 the legend has it that he discovered it while throwing an apple into the air. And, and I was thinking about that law of gravity of what goes up has got to come down. As I was going through studying for this passage of scripture that we're in, we're, we're, we're back. Welcome back. I'm, I'm saying welcome back to me. His story, my life. Man, last week, Andrew, right? I mean, come on. The guy can preach. And uh, that was a lot of fun to listen to. I hope you were at the brewery or I hope you watched online because his message was fantastic. Better than any message I've ever preached. Go back and listen if you want to. We covered John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus, right? So we have the baptism of Jesus and then the heavens open up, the dove comes down and then this is my son, right? Like, ooh, this is the son of God. And, and that was the voice of God coming down saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Do what he says. And he comes up out of the water. And that's where we catch ourselves in this story. He's out of the water now and, and he's heading out. And I was thinking about this, uh, the, the, the law of gravity as we were reading through uh, this story. So if you got a Bible with you, I encourage you, open it up to Luke chapter 4. We're going to cover a few verses there today. Um, this is going to be an experience for Jesus that he probably wasn't super excited to be in. He was he, he was all-knowing. He knew what was going to happen, but he, I, I think a part of him would have been like, man, I would have really not done this if I'm, if I'm, if I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting into a weird place. Never mind. Uh, let's just keep going, all right? Open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 4. If you've got one, if you don't have one, uh, I encourage you to stop this video and grab your Bible. Follow along. I read out of the ESV because I like that translation the best. Uh, You can read out of whatever translation you want to read out of. uh, Go go for it. Whatever translation you've got. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to be on the screen behind me. Or if you're driving, probably not a good idea to open up your Bible at this point. Um, So here we are, Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Understatement of the year right there, maybe of the entire Bible. By the end of it, he was hungry. Yeah, he was hungry because he had just spent 40 days not eating. So he's a hungry fellow. So look at this, verse one, he's led by the spirit into the wilderness. 
Man, sometimes we have these mountaintop experiences, whether it's a baptism, whether it's something we go on a retreat and we just feel so connected with God, but what goes up has to come down. We can't stay on those mountaintop experiences. It's not reality to stay on those mountaintop experiences. Every time I get a chance to speak to students uh, at a winter retreat or something like that, man, they, they, they make decisions for Jesus Christ. They're like, man, we're going to recommit our lives to him. Uh, or, or maybe for the first time, we're going to find salvation. We're going to find Jesus. And I love the Saturday night presentation of the gospel. I love seeing students and leaders stand up identifying with Jesus Christ, saying that they are going to stand for the gospel. They are now choosing Jesus Christ. I love those moments so much. But the next morning is is so important. That next session is so important. And usually it's a session um, that's a little bit lighter. You know, there's a heavy emotional thing on Saturday night. And so the next day you need to keep it a little bit lighter. And the encouragement is this. This is a mountaintop experience. You're, you're, you're experiencing a mountaintop right now. You're in a safe space with all of your friends who believe the same things. You can be open about who you are. You can trust these people. And now you've got to go back into the real world. Now you've got to walk down the mountain and go back into the world uh, that, that you're from, that you live in day to day. And guess what? There's going to be temptations. You're going to go into the wilderness. There's going to be moments for you that are just so incredibly difficult but hold on to the faith. Those mountaintop experiences help us through the valleys, help us through the wilderness. And sometimes we're led by the Spirit into the wilderness, knowing full well that temptation was going to lie ahead. Man, sometimes we're, we're led into the wilderness just for the sake of testing of our faith. James 1, right, says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of any kind. Man, we are going to come up against some stuff. And it says here that Jesus is right after his baptism, right after he goes and is baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin, he comes out of the water and he goes directly into the wilderness. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness. And he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. He's going to fast for 40 days. And through this entire time, he's being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And he was hungry. Sometimes we're going to have these mountaintop experiences and then we find ourselves in the valley. Man, and so I just want to ask you, church, right now, restoration, who are you running to in the wilderness? When, when we find ourselves in those moments of temptation, when we find ourselves in a barren land where there's nothing around us spiritually uh, and, and we need to, to be nourished again, who are we turning to? Who or what are we turning to? Because there's going to be this desire that's in us to, to move towards something, to go towards something that we shouldn't probably go towards. So who are we listening to? Who are we running to in the wilderness? Are we, are we basing it on ourselves or on him? We, we come down from these mountaintop experiences, we face life, the very first thing that hits us and we're like, oh man, I can't believe I'm doing this. What are you running to? Who are you going to be? Who are you going to be running towards? What are you reverting back to? I see this often, especially with, with, with new believers. They, they're, they're running the race. They're running so well. And then something trips them up. They, they hit a life circumstance, especially people maybe who are in addiction of some kind, man. Like, like they, they, they're on this, you're almost like on this spiritual high for so long. It's a honeymoon phase. Nothing can go wrong. Everything is great. Even the worst things are, are considered a blessing because it's like, ah, oh, whatever, I have Jesus. But at some point that starts to wane a little bit. We find ourselves a little bit more in the wilderness. So what do you go to in those moments when it's like, ah, oh, you, you eventually are going to hit a wall. Everybody hits a wall. What comes up has to come down. And so when you come against that wall, when you get into that wilderness, when you, when you find yourself with, with an insurmountable task, what are you running to? So many times we revert back to, to a lifestyle that we said we would never go back to. Why? Because it's safe. It's comfortable. We know it. And, and when chaos is happening, we tend to revert back to the comfortable, to the safe, to the things that we know, to, to the habits that we had before, because at least we know what that is. And so many of us are afraid of the unknown that we're not going to step forward. We're not going to keep moving forward because you know what? I knew what I had there. But God calls us to keep pressing on. James 1 
says this uh, in verse 14 and 15. So after, sorry, uh, after he's talking about uh, James is, is, is writing and says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of any kind. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. He, he follows that up a few verses later and he says this, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, I just want to, I, I, I want to, I want to highlight two different things here for, for a second, all right? Number one, temptation starts with desire. Temptation starts with desire. Desire is an internal thing. If James tells us anything, it says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Now contrast that real quick with what it says about Jesus. Uh, It says for being tempted by the devil. See, temptation comes in so many different ways. We can be tempted both internally and externally. Sometimes our desires bring temptation upon ourselves because we are sinful human. We're we're sinful. So so the desires that we have, desire is internal. Desire is not wrong. Temptation is not wrong. But temptation starts with a little seed of desire. Ooh, I want that. I need that. I desire something. All the way back to the garden, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. And what happened? Eve Eve desired the fruit. She said it, 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 it says that it looked good for eating and it seemed harmless. And so she desired the fruit. And so she took of it and ate of it. It started with desire, led to temptation. Satan was like, you can have this. It's no big deal. Which then led to sin. We can be tempted both internally and externally. Sometimes the temptation is all on ourselves. We try to, we, 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 we blame it so many times on Satan or his minions. Man, sometimes it's just our sinful desire. Man, sometimes that desire is the human side of us. And, and sometimes that desire is genuine. Like I desire relationships. Well, there's two different ways I can go with a desire for a relationship. Number one, I can go a sinful route right? I can go, I desire relationships so I can get on the internet and click on something and and I can have a relationship that way. It's a terrible relationship and I wouldn't recommend it. Or maybe, man, I I desire relationships. I desire physical contact. So I'm just going to go and find somebody at a bar. That's going to be my relationship and I can have unhealthy relationships. The desire isn't wrong. We are built for relationship or I can do it the healthy way, the godly way and say, okay, I desire relationships. So I'm going to find a spouse. I'm going to marry her because I desire a relationship with her. And then I, 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 have a, I need relationships with, with all of my friends. I need, I need accountability. I need all of these things. We are designed for relationship. The desire for relationship is good. The temptation of relationships is not good. It's still not sin. It's not until we actually do the act that it becomes sin. When we entertain it in our mind, oh, I'm going to go do that. And and when is that crossover from temptation to actual um, sin? I, I don't know, lust at some point. Whoever lusts after a woman in her own heart, in his own heart, has committed adultery, is what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. So there's an internal desire. Desire is internal and desire is okay. And we can be tempted both internally and externally. Sometimes our desire is, is, is brought upon by, um, or our temptation is brought upon by ourselves. And sometimes it's Satan attacking us. But notice that it's always Satan tempting Jesus, tempted by the devil. Here's the differentiation. <laughs> Stumbled through that word. Here's here, here it is. Every single desire of Jesus is pure and good. There was no sin whatsoever. He is not from sinful humanity. He identified with sinners. He 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 wanted to um uh, yeah, he he wanted to identify with sinners. I was trying to find the right word and none of them were going to be right. He wanted to identify with sinners, but he was not a sinner. He identified with sinners in his baptism. Now he's identifying with sinners and, and he identified with sinners even in, in the manger, being born in such a lowly way, identifying with sinners. And, and then in his baptism, he's identifying with sinners. And now in his temptation, he's also identifying with sinners and he's going to overcome. Spoiler alert. 
Satan tempted Jesus because his desires were all purely motivated by God. He had no sinful nature in him whatsoever. So every desire of Jesus is pure and good, whereas us, we're fighting this battle internally between our, our, our new creation and the old flesh. There's this battle that continues to rage on within us until the day that we die. It's going to be a battle. We're going to be fighting ourselves. We're going to be fighting our own flesh. We're going to be trying not to give in to the desires of the flesh, but instead the desires of the spirit, desires of what God wants for us. So where are you going to fill your desire? The desire starts in the same place. I desire relationships or I desire uh, financial stability. Great. Desire financial stability. You desire security. You desire comfort. You desire these things. Where are you going to find the desire for these things? Psalm 37, 4 says, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in the Lord, delight in what he has for us, delight in his will for us, and he will give us the desires of our heart. Because in that moment, I've talked about this before, it goes into prayer, right? When my will is aligned with God's will, the things that my heart desires are the things that he desires for me. And so they are perfectly in sync. You remember that? I talked about our wills and his will being in sync. And then if they're not in sync, you can say bye, bye, bye to to answered prayer. That was the best joke I've ever had in my two and a half years of of Restoration Church. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of their heart. So where are you going to fulfill your desire? Okay, my desire is for relationship. I'm going to find it in Jesus Christ first. I'm going to find it in him first. I'm going to delight in the relationship that I have with God and let that sink into me. Let that sink into me. as opposed to the other way around. Man, my desire is comfort, and so I'm going to go to the comforter. I'm going to delight in the Lord. I'm going to delight in the comforts that he gives me, the peace that passes understanding, no matter what goes on, no matter what's happening in my life. Man, I am standing on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. I got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under because of the firm foundation in Jesus Christ that I have. Where are you going to fill your desires? Man, I I desire stability. Where am I going to find it? Okay, maybe maybe I'm going to find it in some sort of uh, something from the world. That's going to be the wrong way to go. That's going to tempt me for more and more and more. I'm never going to find the stability. Or I can delight in the Lord and he's going to give me stability. He's going to give me comfort. He's going to give me peace. He's going to give me rest. He's going to give me life. And he's going to give me relationships. All of my desires are fulfilled in him. Where are you going to fulfill your desire? Jesus goes out into the wilderness fully in step with the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Not to say that he wasn't filled with the Spirit before. He was still full of the Holy Spirit. Now he's still full of the Holy Spirit. And he was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. So are you filled with the Spirit? So that all of your desires are the same as his because we're going to come into those desert places. We're going to hit those rocks, bottoms. Our foundations might be shaken. Especially if it's in anything other than Jesus Christ. So then I ask, I mean, temptation starts with desire. uh, This whole thing. Desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And if I'm delighting in the Lord and he's giving me the desires of my heart, that means I'm spending time with him. I'm investing in him. And he's returning the favor with me. Who are you spending time with? Man, delight in the Lord. Are you delighting in this person or that person or that job or that career or that amount of flexibility and financial stability? Who are you spending time with? What are you putting your trust into? Second thing I want to bring out of this is that temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. If temptation were sin, then Jesus would have sinned. He wouldn't have been God. He wouldn't have been perfect. One second. (laughs) 
saw that that was uh, not where it was supposed to be. Um, I don't know. I don't know why that just did that. I might have to do it again. Who knows? Um, here we go. Temptation is not sin. Oh, man. I've had a week. You had a week? I've had a week. All right. This is what happens when I'm the only one in the room. <laughs> I have to do all that kind of stuff. The, what would have happened, right? If, um, if, if, if Jesus, if temptation was sin, that means Jesus was sin because he was tempted by Satan. So, so temptation is not sin. We get this idea. We start feeling bad about ourselves because we're tempted. It depends on what we do with it. Temptation is like, okay, so y'all know um, I had a colonoscopy a few, uh, like a month ago or so. And if you didn't, well, you know now, right? Everything's good. I'm fine. Good to go. All clear. Good scan. Uh, but here's what I thought of when I was writing this point out. Temptation is, is not sin. T- sin. Temptation is the polyp that they find. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, it's something that could lead to something that you want to get taken care of. You want to remove it as quickly as you can. What you do with the temptation is what's going to say if it's sin or if it's not sin. All right? So if I just leave that polyp in there, guess what? It's going to eventually turn into cancer. It's, it's eventually going to be something that completely ruins my body. If I do nothing about it, if I entertain it, there's going to be more temptation. There's going to be more things spreading. And that's going to turn into cancer and it's going to kill me. Or I remove the temptation. I remove it completely and I get another clear scan. And then when another one pops up, you just remove that one too. Temptation is the polyp. Sin is cancer. And sin leads to death. Sin leads to death. It says, uh, in James 1.15, it says, Then desire, when it, is, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. That, that idea is, um, oh wait, sorry, in 14 it says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That's how sin is going to work. That's how Satan is going to work. We're going to be lured and desired, or lured and enticed by our own desires. It's like, uh, for those of you that hunt, I don't do it. I've, I've fished from time to time, right? I do enjoy fishing. I don't know why I never got into hunting. Just, just never did. Um, here's what happens. Uh, when I go fishing, um, I'm, I'm going to put something on the hook that that fish is going to really enjoy, whether it's a worm or a minnow or something that's even plastic and fake that, that just has the appearance of something that they enjoy. And, and, and so when I, when I put that in there and then it moves like the thing that I want it to look like and, 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 and it looks enticing and, 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 and so the fish is lured to it. That's why we call them lures, right? Uh, and, and so when the fish comes in, it's like, I want that. And it grabs it and then it's, it, it's got its hooks in it. Literally, the hooks are in the fish and you reel it in. It's like, I got this one. That's dinner for me. That's exactly what James is talking about. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We know what our desires are. And for men, specifically men, I can't really speak to women. Here's what it is for men. It usually goes into three different categories. My, my, my man James said this, not James from the Bible, my friend James in Traverse City, right? He says, there's three things that men are always enticed by. Greed, glory, and girls. It's those three. Now, what's number one, what's number two, and what's number three? Because we all have varying levels of it, right? So that's what we're, we're, we're all enticed. Tempt, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And, and that, those desires, when it is fully conceived, when, we, when, when it goes from desire to temptation, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. When we do nothing about that polyp, when we actually feed it, we're giving it more that it needs, more and more of what it needs, man, it's going to lead to death. We put that lure in the water, that fish is going to go after it time and time again because it looks good and it wants it. Romans 6.14 says, the wages of sin is death. Over and over and over and over again. Sin leads to death. Just like the law of gravity, it's the law of human nature. It's the laws that are set in place that sin leads to death. Romans 6.14 also says, but 
the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We haven't gotten to that part of the story yet. It's okay. We know that Jesus is above all things. He's endured all things for us, for our benefit. That because, because now, so that we don't have to live in the first half of Romans 6.14, but we can live in the second half. So many of us are still living in the first half of Romans 6.14. The wages of sin is death. And that's just where we're living. That we're, we're just letting desire rule our lives. We're going this way and that way. And, and whatever whim and thing we can think of, man, we're just going to go in that direction. Because when, when, when it's present, when desire is present, and, and then temptation comes in, the temptation comes in from that, and then we, we continue to move down that road of temptation, that's going to bring forth sin, which is going to bring forth death. The wages of sin is death. And we just keep living in that zone. We keep living in that. We haven't repented. We haven't turned from our, our, our sin towards Jesus. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, which means we have victory over Satan, sin, and death. All three of those things were completely taken care of on the cross because of what Jesus did for us. And he reigns supreme because he didn't just stay in the grave, but he rose again three days later, defeating Satan, sin, and death. And his victory gives us victory over those things as well. So we don't have to stay living in our sin. We don't have to stay saying that the wages of sin is death because we live in the fact that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We don't have to stay in a grave God gives us a way out. 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 10. There's no temptation that God's going to give you that you will not be able to get out of. Or, sorry, there's no temptation that comes your way that God will not take you out of, give you an escape route. God doesn't tempt. When we're tempted, God provides a way out. And that's clearly marked here in the rest of the story. You're probably thinking, when are we going to get to the rest of the story anyway? We've been here for like 40 minutes now. Let's keep going. Verse 3 of Luke chapter 4. We're back in Luke chapter 4. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, To you I will give all these authority, all this authority, and their glory. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you, then, will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So we have these three different temptations that are going on. Jesus is tempted in, in, in three different ways, it, it, but, but they're all kind of the same way. The underlying theme here is we are tempted by instant gratification. See, Satan starts it out with food. He says, hey, man, Jesus, I know you've been in there for 40 days. Uh, you probably need something to eat. Aren't you the son of God? If you're the son of God, which, which we, we all know that you are, since you are, just take these. Take these and eat it. He didn't go after what he knew about who God already was. He knew that he was Jesus and there wasn't anything he was going to be able to do about that. But if he could trick him, if he could manipulate him to do something like this, then he would have him. So he says, hey, you're the son of God. You're hungry. Just make these, these rocks into some bread. And there you go. And Jesus quotes scripture back to him. Jesus quotes scripture right back to him. We are tempted by instant gratification, though. We're, he, he tempts him with food. Hey, you're hungry? You can make something right there. He, he tempts him with greed. Say, say the words and the kingdoms will be yours. He, 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 he tempts him with a request to prove it now. 
hey man, prove that you're the Messiah right now. All these people are gonna wanna know. We're up on this temple, you jump down from here, the angels are gonna catch you. It's in the Bible that they're gonna catch you. Satan was quoting scripture to Jesus and Jesus was having none of it. It's so important that you know scripture because Satan left out a couple of little details in that scripture. And he's gonna try to twist scripture to us as well. Hey, throw yourself off here so people see who you are and get rid of the whole suffering thing. You don't have to do all this stuff. Just prove it right now. Instant gratification. We are so often tempted by instant gratification. Oh man, I could just eat right now. Man, I can just have this relationship right now. Man, I don't have to withhold anything. I can just have it right now. But Jesus is remembering the long game here. Jesus remembers the long game through these, this entire temptation, and that's the most important thing that he does, remembering the long game. We're so obsessed with instant gratification. I want to feel better right now, and I need to make it happen now, uh, especially with relational stuff, guys who are addicted to, to, to sex or, or addicted to porn or something, right? Man, that instant gratification, you mean I can just flip on my phone right now and get to any webpage that I want that has a naked woman on it, and that's going to take care of all my desires. Instant gratification. I don't have to have a relationship with someone. I don't have to go through all the steps to do this, but we're built for relationship, but we're, we, rem, we remove that. We forget about that when we just see it right in front of our face. The instant gratification is, is, is so powerful. We have to continue to remember the long game. So we are tempted by instant gratification. Those three things that Satan is tempting Jesus with, they're all similar things. They're all based in instant gratification. You don't have to wait. Feel better now. It's what he did with Adam and Eve, right? Man, you're going to become like God. Instant gratification. If you eat this, you're going to be like God and you're going to know good and evil. And the trick was they already were like God. Whose image are we created in? God's image. We are created in his image. Adam and Eve were created in his image. They have perfect relationship with God, but Satan tempted them with instant gratification, with something more. Oh yeah, you think you're like God, but you're actually not. He's withholding from you. You better do this to have some more, that you'll be more like God. And, and, and he was right. They were more like God in that moment because now they knew what evil was. All it did was bring evil into them. We're tempted by instant gratification, but if we play the long game, if we know the long game, if we remember the long game, man, Jesus is going to win in the end. Satan doesn't want us to remember the, the, the long term. Satan doesn't want us to think ahead. He doesn't want us to plan things out. He doesn't want us to think long term, only instant, because that's all Satan has. All Satan has is right now. There's no inheritance for him. There's nothing for him in the future. And if he can get people to remember that, or not remember that we also have a future, Man, that we are the ones with the future. If we belong to Jesus Christ, we have a future. Satan doesn't want us to remember that. Satan wants us to, to think right here, right now, because that's all that he has. He doesn't have a long-term plan. He doesn't have the long game. He's got what's right in front of him right then, and he wants everybody else to be a part of that too. Because he knows in the long end, the long game, he loses. So he wants people to take his eyes off the long game. So when we're tempted by things instantly, remember that he's doing it because he doesn't have a long game plan. And we do. And it's an assurance of victory. So here's what I want us to do. And it's not because of our victory. It's not because of anything that we've done, but because of what he's done. We combat temptation with his power. When Jesus went into the wilderness, he was still filled with the Holy Spirit. He was walking by the Spirit. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. Satan comes along and tempts him. After 40 days, the first thing he says is, you're going to want something to eat. Jesus doesn't rely on his own strength, even though he is also God. He chooses to be human, and he, and he recites Scripture back. He combats temptation with, with, with his power. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
So many times we, we start these battles out with being strong in ourselves. I can handle this. My three favorite words that a preacher ever said that, we, that I just steal all the time, right? I got this. Every time we say, I got this, we're relying on our own strength and not his, and we've already lost the, the battle. The temptation battle's already been lost because we think, no, 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 I can handle this. I can take care of this one. Never mind that there's a doctor here who can take care of all of this for me. I think I'll take care of this one on my own. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You've got the God of the universe at your disposal to cover every temptation, everything that you're going through. It's right there for us. All we need to do is ask. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We got we to gotta be ready to go. We need to combat temptation with his power, with his armor. We need to know and live scripture. It's not, and it's not enough just to know scripture. We have to live scripture. Remember, Satan is, is twisting scripture to Jesus, thinking I'm going to trip him up with this. And Jesus just quotes it right back. Man, you don't tempt the Lord your God. He's quoting Deuteronomy to him, but he knows what's happening and he's also living it out. He's living all of this perfectly. Jesus tells us in John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Know scripture. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. It's gonna take more than just knowing the Bible. That's a part of it. That's a big part of it. But is everything else in sync with it? Let's listen. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, stand firm. I'm getting fired up and I know we gotta be closing up here soon. Stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That's how we combat temptation with his power, with his armor. It's not our armor. It's not our knowledge. It's not our strength. It's not our peace. It's not our salvation. It's not our spirit. It's not our word. Those all belong to God and he's giving them all freely to us. It's not our righteousness and it's certainly not our truth. All of this belongs to God. And the moment we say, I got this, we're taking off the armor of God and we're putting on our own puny little armor. And we're fighting against things we don't even understand. In a realm that we don't even, we, we can't even see. No one lives scripture. You have all of these tools at your disposal to defeat temptation. And lastly, we're not alone in this fight. You know, sometimes it feels like we're alone. Sometimes we isolate, but we are not alone in this fight. I want to take you to one more scripture before we get back to the ending of this story. Hebrews 4 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's a direct... Uh, it's, it's directly to Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. Man, he, he, he lived in the wilderness for 40 days. He was hungry. He was tempted by Satan for 40 days. It says he was tempted by Satan those 40 days. And then at the end of it, he was tempted with those three things. It was like a last ditch effort that Satan had. All right, if I can't get him, he hadn't gotten, gotten him to do any of those things in those 40 days. 
Satan didn't just show up at the end of uh, end of the 40 days and be like, all right, now let's do this. No, he was a hindrance to Jesus those entire 40 days in the wilderness. He continued to be tempted by Satan. He continued to get no, oh, that just went away again. He continued very much so. Can you hear me? Good. He continued to uh to get um to get tempted by Satan. So Jesus knows what you're going through. He's lived what you're going through. He chose to be a human. He has been tempted as we are. Yet without sin. So what does that mean? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Because of what Jesus has gone through, because of who he is, we can come to him and say, I need your grace. I need your mercy to help me through this time of need. And he's going to give it to us. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace knowing that he's a part of us. We don't have to go up sheepishly or cowardly or or afraid because we know who Jesus is. We know what he's done for us and we know that he identifies with us. And we can go boldly to the throne and say, I need your grace and I need your mercy. Can I have the armor, please? You're not alone in this fight. If I can encourage you in any way, you're not alone in this fight. And then let's see what happens at the end of this fight, because we are victorious and Satan is not. Here's what happens. Go over to Matthew 4.11. I love the way that Matthew closes this one out. Luke does it similarly, but there's one little detail in this that I want us to to really uh, dive into for the last minute that we have. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The devil left because he had lost. There's nothing else for him. He's not going to keep using his resources there. He's going to go fight some other battles if he can. So the devil had left. The temptation was over. All of it was done. Jesus had won. What I love about this portion is that the angels that the devil had promised, if he had just jumped off right there, off of the, off of the uh, temple, jump off and the angels are going to catch you. That instant gratification, what happens? The devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Satan left, the angels came in. Jesus played the long game, knowing that they were on their way. The angels the demos- devil promised if he had jumped are now present with him and they minister to him which most likely means that they they were feeding him. You need some food here. I got some food for you, Jesus. Man, we play the long game and we know that he's going to take care of every single need that we have. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is the model of delighting in the Lord and giving him, giving us the desires of our heart. So church, whatever it is you're going through, Whatever temptation is coming your way, stand firm in your trial. I told you we'd go back to James 1. I'm just going to repeat it to you. 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Church, play the long game. Stand firm in the faith. Temptations are going to come. God's going to give us a way out of them. And we walk out the door with the whole armor of God on, knowing scripture, knowing that he is the comforter. He is everything for us. And we walk out of that temptation victorious, instant gratification gone, but something that sustains living water bursts out of us. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that we as a church, I pray that me, myself, God, that we would withstand the devil. God, we would withstand temptation. The desires of our heart would be your desires, God. Would you please put those in our hearts? God, would we delight in you? Would we find our foundation? Would we find our faith? Would we find our hope? Would we find our peace and our rest and our comfort and our security in you. God, 
thank you for who you are. Thank you for the love you have for us. It's in your name, the name of Jesus that we pray.